Most people are familiar with the biblical story of the Exodus, where Moses led the 12 tribes, as they were called, to settle in what is now Israel. One interesting detail of this story, which is often overlooked, is that one of those tribes had members that also went north, settling in places like Greece and Sardinia, which also retains the root word Dan in its name. In the book of Numbers, the tribe of Dan is portrayed as the second largest Israelite tribe after Judah. That said, Danoi, used 138 times in the Iliad, are Greek people that Homer identifies as the besiegers of Troy, the Mycenaeans. Their capital was called Mycenae. Could the Danites, who lived in Cain in modern-day Israel, really be related to the Danoi, who lived in Mycenae, modern-day Greece? In Homer's Odyssey, we discovered that the Danoi are migrant people. Even the word Odyssey is literally associated with these migrants. Second, we learned that they are mighty warriors that chase Helen by ship to Troy. Even the great Achilles fights in their ranks. Third, they are expert craftsmen who build the famous wooden horse that fools the Trojans. In the Bible, we find a similar profile for the Danites. We first hear about them in the story of Moses when he leaves Egypt with his 12 tribes heading to the Holy Land. Moses partitions Canaan and gives a portion to each tribe. Judah and his people, the Judahites, get Judea. This tribe later becomes the Jews. The mysterious Danites decide not to take their share and instead are the only tribe to migrate. They head north to a town called Laish, which they conquer and rename Dan, modern-day Tel Dan. The most famous of the Danites is Samson, a mighty warrior more similar to the Greek Hercules than other Hebrew prophets. We also learn that the Danites are expert craftsmen chosen to build the sacred gold-laden Ark of the Covenant. During the exodus from Egypt, some Danites traveled by land to Canaan, while others migrated north by ship to the Aegean. The Danites were seafarers. After leaving Egypt with Moses, some of the Danites may have migrated north by sea and ended up in an area of the Aegean called Mycenae to become the Danoi written about in Homer's Iliad. But can we find archaeological evidence of this migration? Amazingly enough, right after the Jews leave Egypt, vast quantities of gold mysteriously appear in Mycenae, in what are called shaft tombs. To add to the striking discovery, archaeologists believe this gold came from Egypt. But do we have a reason to think the gold came via the Danites? When the Danites helped build the Ark of the Covenant, they covered it in gold, so we know that they are expert goldsmiths. It would make sense that they would have brought their craft and their precious metal to the Aegean. Nowhere in its long journey to the Black Sea does the river Danube look more impressive than here at Budapest, the capital city of Hungary. The Danube is the second longest river in Europe, stretching from its estuary in the Black Sea to its source in Germany's Black Forest. Widely regarded as one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, Budapest can trace its roots back to prehistoric times. It's an intriguing thought, as some scholars have suggested, that the Israelite tribe of Dan incorporated their name into some of the geographical features they encountered on their travels. Starting with Tel Dan in Israel, and in the course of their migrations, the great rivers, the Dnieper, the Don, or even the Danube. Running through the heart of the continent, the Danube has provided a readily available route for armies and all manner of travelers over many centuries, including the lost tribes as they moved westward across the continent. If it is the case that the lost tribes of our story are represented by the Scythians, their presence in the region of the Danube is recorded by an impressive collection of artifacts held here 
in the Hungarian National Museum. The Scythians built enormous burial mounds above their prince's graves and buried their dead with exquisite golden objects. Their precious metalwork was the zenith of nomadic art. This exhibition displays some of the most significant relics of Scythian art and culture and tells us something of the daily life of these people. The Scythians were renowned not only for their military prowess, but for their advanced culture and craftsmanship skills. The Danube was to provide the artery that would take the Scythian tribes into the heart of Europe. By the 6th century BC, successive waves of Scythian attacks overtook much of pre-Roman Iron Age Poland and Germany. In the years since the end of the Cold War, what was East Berlin has undergone an extensive restoration program. The Brandenburg Gate is the architectural icon, not just for the city itself, but for the German people. The city center has been returned to its former grandeur. Nowhere is this reconstruction more apparent than on this small island in the River Spree, on which stand the country's great museums. They hold many priceless archaeological artifacts, including those which tell us something of the Scythian presence in Europe. While the Scythian invasions were accompanied by much violence, there was another, more sophisticated side to their culture. In 1882, a hoard of Scythian treasure was found at the Iron Age archaeological site of Wetterschwelt on the German-Polish border. Some of the wonderful gold objects found there are on display here at the Altes Museum. Taking pride of place in the collection is this golden fish and sword found at Vitaskovo. The exquisite craftsmanship of these items bear testimony to the advanced metalworking skills employed at that time. Historians claim that the Scythians were the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxons who invaded Britain after the Roman withdrawal. The historian Sharon Turner, in his History of the Anglo-Saxons, says, The Anglo-Saxons, Lowland Scots, Normans, Danes, Norwegians, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, Belgians, Lombards and Franks have all sprung from that great fountain of the human race, which we have distinguished by the terms Scythian, German or Gothic. The Roman historian Tacitus and the geographer Ptolemy named the River Elbe and the lower half of the Jutland Peninsula as the places inhabited by the Angles and Saxons before they came to Britain. It's also interesting to note that the British historian Nennius, in his account of the arrival of Hengist and Horsa in England, states that messengers were sent to Scythia for reinforcements. It is therefore possible to trace our Anglo-Saxon ancestors back not only to Northern Europe, but to South Russia and finally to Media, where the Israelites were placed in captivity. The treasures found at Sutton Hoo are to be seen on display at the British Museum, where this impressive helmet takes pride of place. Other items of significance in the collection include the King's shield and sword. These magnificent silver bowls clearly show the Star of David, which suggests a Middle Eastern connection. The native British came to be made up not only of the Cimmerian Celts and Scythian Anglo-Saxons, but also Vikings and Normans. Anthropologists such as E. A. Freeman of Trinity College, Oxford, in his Origin of the English Nation, describes the native Britons as a union of various tribes of the same stock which passed over from the old Teutonic mainland to grow up as a new people. The Encyclopedia Americana records the Scythians arrived in the region of South Russia about 700 BC. Assyrian documents placed their appearance on the shores of Lake Urmia just south of Armenia in the time of King Sargon around 700 BC a date which closely corresponds with that of the first establishment of the first group of Scythians in southern Russia, at the very time that the ten tribes of Israel were fleeing 
from the final Assyrian invasion. The Encyclopedia Britannica states the terms Saka or Saki and Scyths or Scyths are regarded as synonymous. The famous Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the Persians called the Scythians Saki. In rabbinic literature, the kingdom of Ashkenaz was first associated with the Scythian region, then later with the Slavic territories, and from the 11th century onward with northern Europe and was centered on the Rhineland in what is now the westernmost part of Germany. The oldest Nordic historians write that the Nordic and Germanic peoples trekked from the Middle East to North Europe under the leadership of a priest chieftain, Odin. The Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl, internationally famous for the Kontiki expedition, wrote in his final unpublished book that the ancestors of the Nordic and Germanic people came from Azerbaijan, which is near modern Turkey. Thank you for watching this presentation. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist. Please share this video if you learned something today. I rely on word of mouth and greatly appreciate the positive reviews, comments, and would like to remind you to subscribe to my channel to be notified of new video uploads. Thank you to those who have been supporting me through Atlantean Gardens, the nonprofit organization that disseminates my work. Please continue pursuing truth no matter where it leads and I will see you next time.